Hello students of class 12. Today we are going to take up an altogether completely new short story and the name of the story is To Build a Fire and this short story is written by Jack London and this short story had been removed from the reduced syllabus uh, last year uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic uh, by the council for the Indian school certificate examinations but this year uh, with a fresh notification they have included this short story uh, in the new reduced syllabus which you have already been given so let us uh, try to understand this short story it's a very lengthy story and uh, it will take at least four to five videos if not more for me to finish explaining line by line so I hope you will bear with me and uh, you will follow the text and I expect you all to refer to your workbook and also the textbook as I explain this story to you. Now on your screen you can see a scene where uh, the chief protagonist, a man whose name is not mentioned in the story and his companion, a husky. Now that's a dog which lives in the arctic region and uh, basically it hails from the arctic region and it is used for pulling the sledge but uh, uh, here this husky has followed this man uh, out of pure instinct it's not the man's dog it has just been following the man because we know that dogs they love to be close to human beings because uh, they know that they can get food and other things uh, from human beings and that's the reason this dog has been following this man and as you can see from the scene the man is on the verge of freezing to death he is not in a very good shape he is about to die and this dog is in the vicinity but maintaining a lot of distance from the man so that the man cannot do any harm to it so anyway let's read about the author first a little bit and also about the the story the theme of the story and uh, whatever uh, is the content of the story let's try to understand and then let's proceed with the text of the story so i'm scrolling up please follow uh, whatever you see on the screen and then when we take up the workbook portion as well as the textbook portions uh, you need to follow uh, exactly line by line whatever I explained so I'm scrolling up you can see here first I have taken from the workbook to build a fire by Jack London 1876-1916 now here Jack London was born John Griffith Cheney was he was a 19th century American novelist journalist and social activist he was born on 12th January 1876 in San Francisco which is in California USA so all that is given you can just read from the workbook I have just taken the page from the workbook it is there with you so you can just have a look so at the age of 14 Jack London he left school to escape poverty so you see uh, he was uh, uh, actually uh, from a family who were suffering from poverty so he did odd jobs and educated himself at public libraries so he basically uh, taught himself and uh, he was particularly influenced by the writings of Charles Darwin, Karl Marx and Friedrich uh, Nietzsche. So by the age of 30, London was interna internationally famous for his books Call of the Wild published in 1903. Now this has been made into a film. In fact, this short story which you are uh, going to read today uh, has also been made into a film. So if possible, you can make use of YouTube and uh, Netflix and many other options where you can watch videos and try to locate this film. If I get it, I'll provide a link to you too. So anyway, these are the uh, works of Jack London on your screen as you can see and the years are mentioned. You can just refer to your workbook. Now here coming to the story to build a fire published as a short story uh, in Lost Face in 1910 tells us of an unnamed man and a dog in the Klondike region of the Yukon in the northwestern Canada. So the setting of the story is in Yukon Valley uh, which is a very uh, treacherous terrain 
uh, it's very cold it is uh, it, it is always under sub zero temperature and it's not at all now remember that uh, the the backdrop of this story is something which is about more than a hundred years from now so the world was much less developed than it is today and uh, well you could say that Yukon Valley was an area in Canada northwestern Canada which was uh, practically not habitable in those days even today it is very difficult life is very difficult there but practically impossible to be there especially when you are all by yourself and um, those experienced always would say that it's not a good idea to try to cross this area of Canada on foot all by yourself you should always have company you should always have people with you because you never know what kind of situation you may have to face now, it's a very treacherous area of the country so that is what is given here also it traces the man's movement towards his death as he vainly attempts to travel across the Yukon Trail in temperatures dropping to 75 degrees below zero can you imagine minus 75 degrees below zero the dog an inhabitant of natural surroundings on the other hand survives now a husky normally is adapted to that kind of environment uh, it it is a natural uh, it is it is a natural uh, you can say uh, dweller of that particular kind of area so it hails from the arctic region it is used for pulling the sledge as i told you and it can survive in such sub zero temperatures nothing can happen to the dog but for human beings well it's a challenge the man learns that at times human brain and technology is not as useful as the dog's intuitive ancestral understanding of how to stay alive in very cold weather the story is a tragic reminder of mankind's frailty in facing nature unaided by technology so here on your screen you can see the photograph the actual photograph of jack london he is the author he is the one who wrote this story and it's an extraordinary story it's an exceptional story and uh, you must try and understand uh, the 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 predicament or the difficulties faced by the man who decides to take it as a challenge he's a young man and he thinks that he can do it uh, take it as a challenge that he wants to cross the yukun uh, valley on foot all by himself he's actually trying to take a shortcut to reach his friends who are at the other end of the yukon valley in a camp so he thinks he can re easily go there so jack london on your screen in black and white now let's scroll up and see a little more about the story to build a fire by jack london how many characters do we have we have an unnamed man a wolf dog now wolf dog means that is the husky nowadays huskies are kept as pets by many people uh, but remember that these huskies they are uh, creatures of very very cold weather uh, sub-zero temperature region so uh, they can only survive in such cold areas if we try to bring them in warmer places they are likely to fall ill and die so an unnamed man the man's name is not given because the name of the man is irrelevant he represents human beings he represents mankind he is a man versus the wild or versus the nature and the wolf dog representative of nature not that man is not a part of nature but then man has many drawbacks which a dog does not setting up the story the icy cold wilderness of the yukon territory which is situated in canada northwestern canada so you can look up the map of canada the physical map of canada and you can see this particular area now the theme now there are three basic themes on your screen man versus nature struggle for survival instinct and judgment apart from this theme of adventure also so you can refer to the themes given in your workbook because everything is explained in detail also the setting and the title 
so the setting the title and the themes all the themes are given wonderfully well in your workbook please study these things or these aspects of the story from the workbook now the key points of the story are here on the screen uh, a man and his wolf dog have turned aside from the frozen yukun river and are on their way to the old claim on the left fork of the henderson creek old claim a land mass which has been claimed by human beings from nature so it has been named or renamed old claim and it is situated on the left hand side left fork of the henderson creek it is a it is an it is a extremely cold area once he is startled by the crack of the ice underneath he knows that some hidden pools of water flow in the area and that falling into one will spell danger possibly death you know what happens when temperatures are uh, dipping below zero and you fall into a pool of water the moment you come out your entire body gets frozen because you are soaked in water the water freezes almost immediately it happens within an instant so that is the reason why he knows that he could possibly freeze to death he comes across several similar traps and once goads the dog into taking the risk so once he tries to send the dog ahead of him uh, the dog is not his pet so it does not follow his command and in any case the dog is much lighter than the man so the dog can easily step across areas where the man can possibly uh, uh, get inside the uh, the thin sheet of ice can break and he can get inside the hole or the pool of water he comes across sim several similar traps so anyway in it momentarily breaks through the ice pulls itself out and licks its frozen paw the two resume their journey he reaches henderson creek at 10 and eats his meal before setting off again the unbearable cold forces the man to light a fire after some time disaster strikes he breaks through the ice and drenches himself halfway to the knees okay he uses a deposit of firewood under a tree and builds a fire just when he proceeds to dry his feet the branches of the spruce tree a spruce tree is a coniferous tree uh, much like a christmas tree so only evergreen coniferous trees grow in that region and those trees are completely covered with snow and uh, if you light a fire under such a tree what will happen the heat of the fire will cause the snow deposited in the branches above to melt so that is exactly what happens an entire mass of snow and ice falls on the fire and the fire goes out so uh, the full weight of the snow which avalanches towards the man and blots out the fire the man begins his arduous task of rekindling the flames he tries to light the fire again but his numb fingers fail him the man is in a great trouble a faint fear of death seizes him and he starts running which warms him up but he soon gets exhausted and falls to the ground the man freezes to death and the dog trots off in search of other food and fire providers so this is what the gist of the story is but it's a very lengthy one lot of descriptions minute descriptions line by line understanding uh, sometimes may not be possible when you are reading such a huge lengthy story but an overall understanding of the story is must and so uh, and uh, so that you can attempt uh, you know essa type questions uh, if you are asked to summarize if you are asked to give details you should know the text so let's see what we have to build a fire by jack london and it is uh, story number 4 in your uh, short story textbook day had broken cold and gray exceedingly cold and gray when the man turned aside from the main yukon trail and climbed the high earth bank where a dim and little travel trail led eastward through the flat spruce timberland so it had just uh, grown light you could say that it was morning early morning the day had just broken uh, meaning to say the morning had uh, come and it was time for the man to set out on his journey and the day is described as cold and gray because 
and in fact exceedingly cold and grey because it was very very cold. So anyway, the man has to take uh, the trail, the Yukon trail and he has to uh, proceed towards the camp where his friends would be waiting for him. So um, he decided to take this little travel trail, little travel because very few people uh, travelled along this trail. So this was leading eastward through the fat spruce timberland, meaning to say uh, the trail was moving towards the east and uh, this area was covered with spruce trees. These as I told you are like Christmas trees, they are evergreen trees and uh, the entire area is covered with them. It was a steep bank and he paused for breath at the top, excusing uh, the act to himself by looking at his watch. So, it was 9 o'clock. There was no sun nor hint of sun. Though it was morning, though it was 9 o'clock in the morning, one could not see the sun because it was extremely cold. So, in the cold weather, it was a grey morning, maybe very foggy morning also and so the sun was not visible. Though there was not a cloud in the sky, it was a clear day. So, it was a clear day but it, there was a mist. There was no cloud in the sky, still the sun was not visible. And yet, there seemed an intangible pall over the face of things, a subtle gloom. So, this is the initial indication of doom or death. The day itself is grey and cold. Cold and grey are synonymous to death, associated with death. And then, everything seemed to be very dismal. Everything seemed to be very subtle and gloomy. And that was due to the absence of the sun. So it did not worry the man. He was used to the lack of sun. It had been days since he had seen the sun and he knew that a few more days must pass before that cheerful orb due south would just peep above the skyline and dip immediately from view. So uh, that cheerful orb here refers to the sun and remember we are talking about Canada. Canada is not very far from the Arctic and uh, above Canada you have Greenland, land of Eskimos and uh, Canada is essentially a cold country, winters are very severe and because of the northerly, northerly position of this uh, country uh, you have uh, a partial phenomena of uh, longer periods of day during summer and shorter periods of day during winter and as you move towards the north, you may have more of daylight during summer and less of daylight during winter. So it won't be long before the sun uh, won't be visible. It will just come out, it comes out late and it uh, gradually sets. It does not take very long to come, uh, I mean, to set after it rises. So this is because of the uh, northern position of uh, this particular place. The man flung a look back along the way he had come. The Yukun lay a mile wide and hidden under the three feet of ice. On top of this ice were as many feet of snow. So imagine three feet of ice that is solid frozen ice and above that another three feet of snow which is soft. It was all pure white rolling in gentle undulations where the ice jams of the freeze up had formed. North and south as far as his eye could see it was unbroken white save for a dark hair, dark hairline that curved and twisted from around the spruce covered island to the south and that curved and twisted away into the north. So what is that hairline thing? Through the ice that is the trail. That is the trail. So that is explained here after this where it disappeared behind another spruce covered island. This dark hairline was the trail, the main trail that led south 500 miles to the Chilkoot Pass, Dia and Saltwater and that led north 70 miles to Dawson and still on to the north a thousand miles to Nulato and finally to St. Michael on Bering Sea, a thousand miles and, a, and half a thousand more. Can you imagine? So this is the terrain and he is taking up the challenge of trying to 
cross it on foot not that he is going to travel thousand miles he would be traveling only a short distance just a few miles maybe but even a mile along such a trail in such extreme conditions is very very difficult so that brings us to the end of page 35 and we move on to page 36 so here on the screen students you can see the area which is bordered with red it is actually the Yukon region of Canada and uh, now let us zoom in now you can see that straight vertical line that demarcates Canada and Alaska Alaska is part of United States of America and you can see uh, the white line curvy line that is actually the Yukon River and this whole terrain has many small towns and cities uh, you can see the entire area stretching up to St. Michael as uh, it has been mentioned in the text uh, which I have been uh, reading out just now. So you can see that terrain is completely uh, full of relief features and this is the Yokon River and uh, you can see the different places situated alongside the river and this area is practically now developed a lot but a hundred years ago when this story was written by Jack London situation was completely different this area of the Yukon Valley in Alaska as well as in Canada was something which people did not uh, prefer to travel across especially in winter so this is the Yukon River stretching all the way uh, down to uh, Bering Strait of Bering Sea and here you can see the river meandering in different areas and uh, uh, this is the whole terrain before you and it's a very rough terrain and it is only the ones who are adventurous uh, the ones who can actually take the risk of traveling in this area who go into this area of course nowadays uh, trekkers uh, basically travel for trekking expeditions but in those times hundred years ago situation was quite different and now I'm going to show you uh, some photographs now, this is the winterscape and uh, this is the these are the polar lights which are visible in Yukon region you can see the beautiful array of lights in the sky so here you can see once again the winter landscape of the Yukon region and once again you can see the polar lights in the sky and the spruce trees and this is the aerial view of the Yukon Valley in winter taken from an airplane uh, you can see the amount of snow that is covering this area and those are the spruce trees beautiful coniferous trees evergreen trees and uh, this is when spring starts approaching and winter starts moving away that you can see uh, the log cabin this is the log cabin the kind of cabin where the man was supposed to reach where his friends would be waiting for him so let us now continue from page 36 but all this the mysterious far-reaching hairline trail the absence of sun from the sky the tremendous cold and the strangeness and weirdness of it all made no impression on the man it was not because he was long used to it he was a newcomer in the land a chechako and this was his first winter so this guy the protagonist the man in the story he's a newcomer in that area of Yukon and he was uh, a Chechako now a Chechako is possibly the name of his tribe or the clan to which he belongs so he was the man from a different community and he was visiting this area and this was supposed to be his first winter which means he was not experienced about the situation here in the Yukon Valley the trouble with him was that he was without imagination the problem with this man was that he could not foresee without imagination means somebody who cannot see uh, what the future is going to be like or who cannot possibly imagine 
uh, the worsening situation of the future, uh, one who is not careful about what could possibly happen. So such a man. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things and not in the significances. 50 degrees below zero meant 80 odd degrees of frost. So if the temperature dips to 50 degrees below zero, the frost or the layer of thin ice which forms on every object which is exposed to nature is supposed to be uh, is supposed to be uh, 80 degrees 80 degrees of uh, frost which means that it is supposed to be 80 degrees below zero so 50 degrees of the temperature below zero means 80 degrees below zero frost so that is the situation such fact impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable and that was all it did not lead him to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature and upon man's frailty in general uh, able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold and from there on it did not lead him to the conject conjectural field of immortality and man's place in the universe so this is a general statement which jack london is trying to make here uh, he's trying to mean that man as such is very very vulnerable to such threats of nature man is very delicate man thinks of himself as very powerful because he has brains but physically he is much more delicate than animals animals especially wild animals they are built to be exposed and to face all odds of nature so they have their protective instincts as well as protective physical features or their bodily abilities are more than that of man man can tolerate certain uh, certain degrees of coldness or certain degrees of heat but uh, that is uh, limited and uh, after that man succumbs man dies so man should always be careful because god has given man the brains to think so man should always be careful to judge what could possibly go wrong but this man unfortunately our protagonist does not have any imagination as the author puts it so uh, 50 degrees below zero stood for a bite of frost that hurt and that must be guarded against by the use of mittens, ear flaps, warm moccasins, moccasins are shoes and thick socks. So this is how man tries to protect himself against the cold by wearing such items of uh, of uh, protective gear like mittens what are mittens these are kind of gloves with uh, only the thumb and uh, you know the rest of the fingers are together in one so that's called a mitten and ear flaps ear flaps to keep your ears covered so that you don't catch cold warm moccasins now moccasins are shoes without laces where you put your feet inside them and uh, that's what he's uh, planning to wear and of course thick socks 50 degrees below zero was to him just precisely 50 degrees below zero he has no experience he, this is his first winter he doesn't know that 50 degrees below zero means many more things so he thinks 50 degrees below zero i'll take protection and i'll be fine that there should be anything more to it than that was a thought that never entered his head as he turned to go on, he spat speculatively. He was thinking. In a thoughtful mood, he just spat out. There was a sharp, explosive crackle that startled him. He spat again and again in the air before it could fall to the snow. The spittle crackled. So this is how in cold areas, in cold places, people test how cold it is. So when you are spitting out of your mouth, it's uh, your sputum is warm because your body temperature is uh, identical to the temperature of the spit that you are spitting out. But if it freezes and crackles in the air almost instantaneously, then you know that it's pretty cold. It's very, very cold. 
He spat again and again in the air before it could fall to the snow. The spittle crackled. He knew that at 50 below, spittle crackled on the snow. But this spittle had crackled in the air. So there is a difference. If it crackles in the air itself before even falling onto the ground, it must be very, very cold. So the moment you spit out, it freezes in the air before it can even fall on the ground. So he was testing and he realized that this is the situation. Undoubtedly, it was colder than 50 below. How much colder he did not know, but the temperature did not matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek. We have already discussed this before. Where the boys were already, his friends, other guys were waiting for him. They had already reached that place. They had come over across the divide from the Indian Creek country where he had come while he had come the roundabout way to take a look at the possibilities of getting out logs in the spring from the islands in the Yokun. So lumbering is a major operation and major you can say occupation in this region of Canada and United States. What happens is you do the lumbering and you let the logs float down the river but in winter the river gets frozen and the logs are frozen inside the water and when spring comes the water once again starts flowing and the logs then flow down to the lower end of the river. Now this man he had the intention of searching for logs, logs of wood in winter. If he searched, he could get some frozen logs in the river water and if he could manage to haul out one or two, it would help him out uh, in some way or the other. Maybe he, he just wanted to collect those logs. So that was his whole idea. So that is the reason why he had come to this place, whereas his uh, companions, they had already reached, uh, already reached the old claim where uh, they were already waiting for him. He would be in to camp by 6 o'clock, a bit after dark. It was true, but the boys would be there, a fire would be going, and a hot supper would be ready. So this man, 9 o'clock in the morning, he starts. He is going to take a shortcut through the Yukon Valley to reach Henderson Creek, uh, the area called Old Claim, where he will reach a log cabin, and uh, there will be some people, uh, his companions, they will be waiting for him. Food will be ready and hot water and coffee and things like that. So he was thinking about that possibility that a bit after 6 o'clock he would be able to reach. So uh, it was true but the boys would be there, a fire would be going and a hot supper would be ready. As for lunch, he pressed his hand against the protruding bundle under his jacket. Protruding means something which is sticking out of his body because he has stuffed it inside his jacket. It was also under his shirt, wrapped up in a handkerchief and lying against the naked skin. So we have come to the end of the second page of the story, page 36. It was the only way to keep the biscuits from freezing. So he was carrying only biscuits for lunch. And even biscuits can freeze in such extreme temperatures. Can you imagine? We cannot imagine sitting here in India because we don't have such extremes of temperature anywhere in India. He smiled agreeably to himself as he thought of those biscuits. Each cut open and sopped in back and grease. So he had layered the biscuits with with the fat from, from uh, taken from pork and uh, that's how the biscuits were greased and each enclosing a generous slice of fried bacon. So there was uh, pork fat and also slices of meat. So he had made kind of sandwiches out of those biscuits and he had then packed them and he had stuffed them inside his jacket and he was carrying these as his lunch. He plunged in among the big spruce trees. So the trail was faint, a foot of snow had fallen since the last sled had passed over and he was glad he was without a sled traveling light. So he was feeling happy that he was traveling without a sled. Now if you have a sled, a sled is a sledge. Uh, in American English it is SLED. 
but in British uh, English the spelling is S L E D G E. So S L E D G E and S L E D mean the same. Drawn by huskies. Now in this case the man was not having a sled and he was feeling happy about it that I don't have a sled so I don't have the burden of uh, of uh, maintaining a sled using it for traveling. I am traveling light. I don't have much luggage. I don't have any hassles. So that is what he was thinking. In fact, he carried nothing but the lunch wrapped in the handkerchief. He was surprised, however, at the cold. It certainly was cold. He concluded as he rubbed his numb nose. Numb means already very cold and therefore there is no sensation in his nose. So it has become numb. And cheekbones with his mittened hand. He was a warm whiskered man. But the hair on his face did not protect the high cheekbones and the eager nose that thrust itself aggressively into the frosty air. So he had a kind of beard on his, on his cheeks and down his uh, cheeks and up to his chin. But that was not sufficient to provide him any kind of protection against the cold. At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky. Now this is the dog. We have seen the dog and the man in the beginning of this video. So this big husky, the proper wolf dog, grey coated and without any visible or temperamental difference from its brother, the wild wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. The animals, they have their instincts. They know when it is time for uh, them to move out or travel and when it is time to find a shelter so the animal was actually aware of the fact that this was an adverse season and therefore traveling should be avoided its instinct told it a truer tale than was told to the man by the man's judgment in reality it was not merely colder than 50 below zero it was colder than 60 below than 70 below it was 75 below zero since the freezing point is 32 above zero now we are counting we are counting the degrees in fahrenheit and not in centigrade okay so 32 degrees above zero that is the freezing point it meant that 107 degrees of frost obtained the dog did not know anything about thermometers. Possibly in its brain there was no sharp consciousness of a condition of very cold such as was in the man's brain. But the brute had its instinct. Brute refers to the beast or the dog as such. It experienced a vague, vague means unclear, but menacing apprehension that subdued it and made it slink along. The dog was fearing the strangeness of nature and it was scared and so though it was following the man it seemed to be very timid very scared as it was doing so so it was slinking along at the man's heels and that made it question eagerly every unwanted movement of the man as if expecting him to go into camp or to seek shelter somewhere and build a fire. The dog was expecting this from the man. But the man does not have that kind of instinct and therefore is all set and ready to make the journey. The man is on his way. The dog had learned fire and it wanted fire or else to burrow under the snow and cuddle its warmth away from the air. The frozen moisture of its breathing had settled on its fur in a fine powder of frost and especially where its jowls, muzzle and eyelashes whitened by its crystal breath. So this is the description of the dog the way it was uh, uh, seeming to be, it looked like and it was following the man. So we have come to the end of page 37. In this video we are stopping here but we will continue in the second video, uh, second part from page 38. 
so i hope i have been able to explain so much as the introduction of the story is concerned and also the other related uh, facts like the setting the backdrop and the situation uh, is concerned so that's it for the time being thank you very much